Miss Virginie, Mr. Clay is prepared to pay a hundred guineas if on a night appointed by him, you will come to his house. His house? Yes, to his house. In reality, I never picked the immortal story. The immortal story picked me. Uh, in other terms, I had noticed in the trades that Orson Welles was going to do a movie in France. In my wildest dreams, I never thought it would be me shooting it. What happened is one of the operators, he had at Chimes at Midnight, recommended another cameraman. So the two first days of the immortal story were shot by another cameraman, Walter Wattitz, who is dead now. And for some very strange reasons, Walter Wattitz were, was very intimidated by Orson and was scared. So he was always mumbling and never talking at the normal level of voice. And he was very academic. There was no communication. What can I say? That happens a lot. I mean, it can happen to anybody, even to a very good cameraman. So one day I had a phone call from a producer. She was very tough with me, but I went to see them. And the reason I was there is because Orson had seen on television a movie I had shot with Anna Karina, the actress, called Anna. It was a musical by a young, really very bright director, but it's totally a different style than what Orson was doing himself. So uh, I went to see uh, Orson Welles at the Hotel Raphael in Paris. I saw him in his room. He was wearing a pink pyjama and smoking a cigar. And he started to talk to me, and uh, he asked me how we'd shoot the movie. I had not read the script. It was made for television, basically. And what kind of equipment was I going to use to be able to shoot this movie in a very short period of time? And immediately I had the answer and I said, no, I don't want to work with Fresnel, which is your signature. I want to work with something called Master Lights, or which was called Color Tran at that time. And Orson Welles immediately smiled and told me, you know this, this was invented by the gaffer we used on the on Citizen Kane. Oh, good, I didn't know that. The difference in the lighting is the Fresnel is a very hard light where you control the harshness or the softness with a knob. And this is a classical light until, uh, I would say, uh, the new wave. It's still used. I use it sometimes in different type of movies I want to do. But I thought that, in my guesstimation, it was my subjective position. I could never try to have Jean Moreau look 17 by using hard light. And then, uh, how do you see the color in, in this movie? And he, I said, OK, you might disagree with me, so I'm taking my chances. So I'm suggesting to play with the colors instead of playing with the contrast, opposing colors to contrast, make some soft photography. I said in French, couleur instead of valeur, color instead of contrast. And he immediately jumped on that and said, it's fantastic, it's a very good idea. So I used softer source, and years ago, before it became a fad, I was using frost, which was not existing at that time. So I was using coda trace. Everybody was looking at me like a fool. It was a kind of a paper used for Xeroxes by architects. And everybody was saying, look at this current, he's using this thing. He's... Everybody uses it now. And now they are selling rolls, millions of rolls of this material all over the world. And kind of, uh, it was kind of a Mickey Mouse thing, but uh, Orson liked it. So, uh... and once in a while I was doing something more contrast. When we moved to Spain, of course, the set was totally different. Uh, there was no more set designer. Uh, the only people having flown to Spain were uh, Jean Moreau and myself. OK, so I went to the set next day in a very electric atmosphere because I arrived there and everybody was looking at me. There was a great moment of silence. I had to take over the entire crew. Immediately, the electricians helped me. 
They understood it was another method. They immediately helped me. The key grip also helped me. And some other people were kind of reluctant at the beginning. And we shot this scene with the candles and the chandeliers in a mirror, which was not the easiest thing to start with. With long movement back, the operator was terrified by the framing because Orson was wanting to frame so wide that the lights were on the edge on the image. And if you do a movement, if you frame very fast, uh, without even noticing it, you can have the lights in your shot. So he was terrified. There is also a scene with Jeanne Moreau in her bed. The sailor says uh, she's 17. Of course, Jeanne was 37 instead of 17. And I had to make her look good, so I photographed her through the gauze, very soft. And well, the curtains are opening, the image is becoming brownish because it's kind of bleached when it's shot through the gauze. And one of the timers of the lab was there and said, uh oh, it's not very good. And Orson, in a very loud voice, said, it's wonderful. Looking at this lab, idiot, they are all the same. And I didn't know what to do myself because I was working with that lab, idiot, since a few years. But, you know, it's just a, uh, another approach. So he liked it very much. It's not only for Jean Moreau's self-photography. It's because I was opposing only colors to colors in kind of a sort of softness without being pastel. I didn't want it to be pastel, but some softness. Sometime I'm still doing it now. It's not very fashionable to do that now. You know, it's uh, the thing you're an old cameraman when you try to do things like that. Color control I know very well. For one good reason, aside of the new wave, I have a French training which is totally different from an American training. I spent a lot of time in the lab. We had photochemical classes, very, very strong. I know how to manipulate the gamma film stocks and all these things. And a lot of other people just think somebody else is going to do that. But I can lower the contrast by under-processing the film stock, knowing exactly what I'm going to get. And I didn't have the time to do testing during the immortal story because I was right in, you know. But uh, let's say I was lucky and uh, a lot of other things we did like this, you know, and he was kind of uh, liking me. Uh, so my collaboration with Orson was kind of very good. Lately, it's run through offices and counting houses. Pico, baby, I told Miss Virginie. Oh, another detail. The operator left. After one day, he was so scared. So not only did I do the lighting, but I operated the camera. And in operating, Orson saw immediately that I didn't need a lot of rehearsal. I had a past of a uh, news combat photographer, which was not an aesthetical uh, past there. But I really, uh, I was not scared. I was doing things, and I was very good handheld also. And uh, that's a thing Orson was liking a lot, because uh, even he, he did very sophisticated things with big uh, Hollywood camera operators or DPs. Uh, he liked to grab things on the spur of the moment. And that's really, uh, without having a very strong ego, I was the ideal choice for what he was doing. And I was very quick. And I was always there, the first one on the set. I was so scared not to be, not scared by Orson. Uh, I was so scared not to be there in time because it was past the suburbs of Paris. And the two first persons on the set were always myself and Orson second, and the crew was arriving later. So. There are a lot of shots we did by ourselves, two of them, two of us, uh, with a small camera, the CM3, like you have a shell bouncing and all these things. We did that before the crew arrived. I don't suppose you've got a family in Europe. What's your name? Levinsky. One day we were in Chinchon and uh, the oh, tracks and the lighting did not arrive, so, and the motor of the camera uh, broke. So uh, I shot handheld with a case, documentary camera, the CM3, with a very heavy motor, which was a sync motor, and it's not handheld. And I had a film critic asking me not so long ago, maybe last year, can you explain to me why uh, this uh, moving track is handheld? What was the motivation? And I said, OK, the motivation, there was a truck supposed to come with some equipment. It never arrived in Chinchon, so we did handheld. Creatively, in this new wave films, I did exactly the contrary of what I did with Wells. 
the great difference for me was like a Japanese couturier or dressmaker with Godard, he was wanting to destructure the image. So he asked me not to frame well and to cut people in half on the side of the image, which was very hard for me because the instinct from a guy having worked in news or uh, document, what you call documentary was to frame right and to hit the right framing and then I had to hit it and leave and cut somebody in half on the side of the image so that would never happen with Wells where every framing was really a, a piece of art and if I have to state something where I learned asymmetric framing it was with Orson composition on locked off shots, it was with Orson. And at the beginning, of course, he was looking very carefully at what I was doing. And during the half of the immortal story, it was like this, the composition was his. And of course, I didn't mind that. I did learn a lot of things there. But the difference is, framing was very, very rigorous. He's young, and Lubinsky is full of the juices of life. Yes. Of course, there was a, a discussion about angles and the choice of wide angles all the time, and I resisted certain things and certain things I won. For him, uh, I mean, uh, you know, uh, lenses at that time were going from uh, 18 millimeter to 100 millimeter. This was a normal set. He was working mostly with the 18, the wide, super wide angle at that time, and the medium wide angle, uh, the 25. And uh, one day again in Spain, uh, the equipment was not there. There were some moving uh, shots of, uh, you know, this uh, carriage. And I said, Orson, we don't have it. Why don't we shoot that? This was day for night. Why don't we shoot that with a long lens? And then the background is going to move behind it. And he said, are you sure? And he was a bit scared. Oh, yeah, well, let's try it. And we shot it with 150 millimeter for the first time of his life. And that's how we did those shots, you know? And again, in those cars, we didn't have steady cam. I was doing it handheld. And We did Macau with a few pieces of linen and a uh, few flags and almost nothing. That's where, when we were in despair and the equipment did not arrive, and he hated the idea of not shooting, so we shot, you know. There is a scene where uh, Roger Coggio, the actor, has to read a uh, religious Jewish book, and he reads it left to right. And I said to Orson, hey, Orson, this is not Hebrew. What do you mean this is not Hebrew? In Hebrew, it's from right to left. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. OK, uh, we redid it. <laughs> I mean, it was very funny. And also, in those scenes, Roger Kodjo is reading a book, and Orson had the ID to illuminate his face. It's his ID, not mine. So we put aluminum foil, the one you use in the kitchen, between the pages of the book. And we hit the light from very high, and this was rebouncing on his face. That gives this very strange feeling. Maybe he found that he would be able to experiment things with me. He would not be able to experiment with a very big, heavy crew uh, or in Hollywood or something like that. And he probably he had those ideas since a long time, and he wanted to experiment them. Some people hated the photography of the immortal story and told me some directors I had worked with, because how come they do something so soft? Uh, I don't recognize Orson Welles' style. Yeah, it's because we were doing a movie primarily for television, and he didn't want it to be rejected. And also, it's the last professional work of Orson Welles. The rest has never been finished. It's the last finished professional work directed by Orson.